much more talkative than the first lot, although quite a lot of you were here in the beginning, so I, I do think there's some alcohol going on in there <laughs> somewhere. How many of you were Welsh? How many of you were slighted in the first session by the fact that we couldn't sing? <laughs> quite right, me too. <laughs> okay, well, this is... Uh, no, no, that's okay. Anyway, went to the doctors. <laughs> I said, I feel like a pair of curtains. He said, pull yourself together. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Geeks, look at that. Yes, thank you. Lovely. Look at that. See, there are a few words, aren't there, that give you away as well. It doesn't matter how long you live in England. <laughs> Lovely is one of them. And fantastic. <laughs> is the other one. All right, so geeks. Um, who's a geek? Who's proud to call themselves a geek? Who's got geek written on their team? <laughs> Quite right. Being a geek is kind of cool again. But you know what? That means that we have some responsibilities, like protecting the world from Daleks. People say that geeks don't do anything cool. People say that geeks never do anything. It is basically all Daleks. I'm sorry, the whole presentation. <laughs> People say that geeks are not very social. Yeah. People say that we're scared of the sunlight. <laughs> That's us doing Tai Chi at Over the Air Hack Day in September at Imperial College at 7 a.m. <laughs> after a whole night of coding. Um, oh, sorry, I don't know how that got in there. <laughs> Moving on. People say that when you're a geek, you're in your bedroom and you eat unhealthy food. To be fair, that's 24 hours old. The, the table on the left was full of chocolate. <laughs> but it's a good photo nonetheless. But the point is, watch this. Hello, I'm Izzy Knowles and welcome to MASHED. What is MASHED, I hear you ask? Well, last year the BBC ran a very successful hack day with Yahoo, where 500 developers developed innovative internet applications. This year, the BBC presents MASHED, a two-day event where developers from across Europe are given the opportunity to make more groundbreaking internet applications. 500 developers registered online at the BBC Backstage website in order to be here today at Alexandra Palace. They ticked off their name, they picked up their pass, and they got their free bag of goodies. So what are the rules of MASHED? Well, they've got 24 hours stuck in this room, and at the end, they've got a 90-second presentation of their project. They can do anything as long as it's not illegal or offensive. Here, John I think it's very important in terms of it makes people speak and it makes people stay together and do things together. You get people that are not necessarily working for the same companies work together in teams. So the whole agile development thing is a good testing ground for these kind of events. We're here basically to, uh, to start to tap into, I guess, the creative and innovative people that are out there outside of the four walls of Lonely Planet to, uh, to start to imagine a new set of services and products that might be created. We're going to have 70 or 80 projects at the end of the day, all of them amazing, all of them collaborative. I think, yeah, it should be really powerful. I'm really that was an aeroplane, an actual full-on aeroplane. You can carry on now, sorry. Sound? Have we broken it by speaking? Oh, this is the good bit. It's frickin' lasers. <laughs> Sound from the laptop? Oh, I broke it by speaking. Anyway, frickin' lasers. These people <laughs> were building a laser maze. I mean, they, they, this, um, that's okay, I'll crack. The, uh, the, the point of this event, and the reason I did this event, and this was the, the, the coolest thing I have ever done, was organize a hack day. And they were started originally by Yahoo in the States. And we kind of stole it completely. Um, and the idea is you get people who are proud to be geeks in one room and you say, do cool stuff. You don't say, you know what, we're looking for the next version of the Lonely Planet guidebook on mobile. You don't say, 
What's a cool thing we can do with Doctor Who? You say, come along and do cool stuff. Microsoft came along. It's questionable whether or not I was going to invite them. I mean, to invite Microsoft to, go to do cool stuff. They brought their robotics team. They flew blimps around Alexander Palace all day. Another guy brought um, a, a rocket, powered rockets. He couldn't get them to work, so he built, uh, he wanted to fire the rocket and take photographs. He couldn't get the rocket to work with the proper propellants and everything, so he built a Mentos and Diet Coke rocket and attached the camera to that instead. <laughs> but the, the whole point of, oh God, that was a bad phrase to phrase on. <laughs> This guy, Ewan Spence, built an airplane. I mean, out of wood and admittedly wouldn't fly, but they figured out how to fly an airplane around the world in 24 hours in Google Earth. Why would you want to do that? It actually produced a shed load of data for other people to build things on so that you could figure out how you could take live data from an actual plane flying over the Atlantic and what cool stuff could you do with it? How oh, frigging cool is that? I mean, getting live data from a 747 as it's flying over the Atlantic and doing something to visualize that data. Um, to be a geek is to be cool. To be a geek is to be powerful. And with great power <laughs> comes great responsibility. And it is true, because the reason, the reason that we do these events, the reason that we fill rooms with cool people doing cool stuff is because you get something out of the end of it. And that something can be social. It can be the fact that you've just gone along and you've met people who uh, are interested in the same things as you. It could be that you go along and you haven't got a clue how to code. We had people turn up who didn't know how to write a line of HTML. But they had a fantastic idea. And they, they wanted to make something. And in the most, most cases, ignoring lasers, freaking lasers, the, the, what people wanted to do was make the world a better place. And that's why I do it. That's, that's why I'm involved in these things. That's why I want to organize them, because it's about making the world a better place. And actually, that responsibility is really important if you're a geek, because we have an awful lot of power in our hands. When you know how to take data from government, and you know how to get that data and do stuff to it, you have a responsibility to teach the rest of the world either how to do that or how to read the data or to display it in a way that makes sense to normal people. There's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Well, when you're a developer, when you're a geek, you can kind of cut through all that crap and you can help people discover the truth of what lies be beneath that data rather than the statistics. So, this is really you know, one of the most famous infographics ever. It's Napoleon's march to Russia and back. And it displays all of the data that you need to know. So the thickness of the line on the top there is, is the number of people that left. And the black line is the return journey. And you can see how few soldiers. You can see there was a branch. They went off and fought somewhere else and you know, died quite a lot. Uh, you can see the weather, so you can see that when there were snow blizzards, you can see how many people were lost, you can see where they crossed specific geographical regions. And the way that worked, the way that was created was because somebody who understood the data, somebody who could pull the statistics, somebody who could find that data, worked with somebody who could display that data in a meaningful manner. Now that's a great, that's a great way of, of displaying that, that information, and that's at the core of what it means when you get hold of of, of publicly available data. There are willing governments, there are organizations, there are bodies that are very happy to give us this data. In Australia, we ran a hack day. Uh, this is Dr. Nicholas Gruen, he's chairman of the Internet 2.0 Task Force, set up about six months ago, but Internet 2.0 Task Force, and they do, you know, they look at how you make government 2.0. How is the Australian government 2.0? Now, the cool thing about that is the Australian government is completely behind this. They worked really hard to make their data accessible. But they didn't do it in a way that set up rules about the APIs and they didn't set it up. What they did is they ran a hack day and said, here's all the raw data, come along and do stuff with it. And the idea wasn't that you built applications and you displayed that data and you, get, you, know, you, you let people understand it. The idea of that hack day was simple. How do we take this raw dump of crap and get it in a format that developers can really use? Now, that's fantastic. I mean, Dr. Nicholas Gruen stood up. No, so, sorry, one of, the, one of the senators stood up. 
and said that Australia was catching up with the rest of the world when it came to this stuff. Australia was catching up with Britain when it came to access to public data. <coughs> yeah, I chuckled at the back. And then I was invited to talk, and I stood up, and I said, with the greatest respect, Mr. Senator, um, you're talking bollocks. <laughs> because Australia... <coughs> Don't do it, by the way. I'm, I, I've, I'm out of Australia now. My visa's cancelled. That's the truth. But the, the whole point of that is that Australia is well ahead of the rest of the world. The government wants people to access this data because ultimately it makes them uh, accountable. There are less willing governments. There are governments that, that like to provide certain access to certain data but not access to other data, mentioning no names. Um, there, are <laughs> there are governments and organizations that don't want you to get to that. But there are ways and means to get that data. And as a geek, we have a responsibility sometimes to go and find that data in CSV files hidden, you know, in the basement, in the disused toilet, in a filing cabinet with a tiger sitting on top of it. But it's there because legally it has to be made accessible. We have a responsibility. To, to pull that out of there and, and put it in a, in a format that other people can, can use to make things. And that's often the first step. Now, we're at that step. That's where we've got to. Now, now we have to get to that infographic stage. Now we have to get to the point where people can actually understand that data. And that is the true power of the geek. We may not have capes. We may not have wear our pants on the... No, we do wear our pants on the outside sometimes. But, the, you know... That is the power. That is the important thing about being a geek. It's not playing anymore. Being a geek is so important to society today. We see this played out every day when Google pulls out of China, when Google is arguing with China. That's geeks arguing with the national government of China. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, it's okay, it's not standing in front of a tank, but that is a geek telling the Communist Party in China what they should be doing and what is right and wrong. And that's on a global scale. That's not local politics, that's not local disputes, that's not... Geeks are the one true global force for good that we have right now. We have that power in our hands. And I'm urging you today to use that power, and perhaps we get badges made or something. But, you know, the reason we do this, we hold governments to account. We help people understand. But more importantly, and this is the reason I do it, is because we discover cool stuff. That's why I do research and development. That's why I do innovation. That's why I mess around. My job description is one page of A4, and written in the middle it says, do cool stuff. And that's incredibly powerful. And we just need to, we just need to take that on, on board as a, as a community. But ultimately, as I've said already, the reason that this is important, the reason that we have access to this data, the reason that there is an outcry, admittedly in a slightly nasally voice, <laughs> um, people like Jeremy Clarkson don't like very much, but the reason there is this outcry is because we can do it, we can affect change. The number of social hacks we saw come out of the first hack day and the second hack day, the number of applications we saw come out at over the air at the Imperial College for, for mobile devices that were about mundane things like I want to report that there is a pothole in my road and, and somebody built this in us, it's, it's copied off um, a, British, uh, a British idea of report a problem, it's a website you know and it finds out who your council is and it figures it out automatically so you don't have to go into difficult websites, you don't have to, anyone rung their council recently? Holy crap. But anyway, they've got automated systems to deal with things like reporting potholes, but nobody can kind of plug into them. A bunch of British hackers built a system that lets you get into that kind of reporting system and means that you can affect change. In Australia, they took the same idea and they called it, it's buggered, mate. <laughs> and it's fantastic. It, it, it links into all the municipal services. It kind of figures out you know, who's in charge of what, and it sends automatic emails. They took it a step further because the Australian government loved it, and they, they wanted to actually plug in to the official reporting system within the mun municipal powers so that, that you could effect it. Now, geeks did that. Geeks built a system that means that I can complain about a pothole in my road. You're underwhelmed. <laughs> 
But you have to realize that is the first step in affecting real change. That is the first step of you and me here now with a little understanding of HTML, CSS, sitting next to somebody who's got a brilliant idea about how to change the world, sitting next to the, someone who's really, really good designer, getting together and effecting change because we can, because we have the tools at our hands. But we do this because we want to make the world a better place. We want to affect a global conversation that encompasses everybody. We want to solve those problems that can help us make the world a better place. And ultimately, we want to do this because we want to sit around a campfire and have a good natter and not have to worry about how we report a problem in our street, how we find out whether or not unemployment figures really have gone down and what the effect really is over the last... We shouldn't need to worry about that stuff. That stuff should be so easy for us that we should be able to relax on the beach around a fire and have a conversation. Thank you. <laughs>